therapy with couples is special. You are probably trained in individual schema therapy, and you'll find yourself in a much more difficult situation, a bit like this, when you start working with couples. Construct needs some specific therapeutic skills, which are more challenging than the individual therapy. It means that you have to be very active and respectful in a friendly atmosphere, but you have to be much tougher, much more intrusive, much more directive than you are used to do when you work with individuals. When you look at the chairs, we, you have to sit quite close together, that you can reach out for the couple, that you can pull them at their rests and calm them down because some of them engage quite You well. have to sit much closer, that you can intimately talk to them. If you have a distance of two or three yards, this is too much. You'll see when you work with them. Um, you can use the wording of the client to uh, interlock with their models and look at the nonverbal expressions. When they start looking somewhere else, checking their nails, they are not in contact anymore and you have to interrupt. Like you maybe know with the group therapy, you have to monitor both partners and as soon as one seems to drop out, you have to get in touch with him because if you lose one of the couple, you lose the couple. You have to keep the process under control. This is what Chiara already mentioned. You have to catch the bullets. P Travis Atkinson put it, it this way. You have to catch the bullets that there are no hurdings in the therapy room. It must be a safe place. And this works best if you teach the clients to talk to you first and then start to talk to each other. So in the first sessions, the conversation is directed over you. You're in the center and you just let them talk to you. And it, you stop immediately when they start clashing and yelling at each other. This were the bullets. Um, of course, this is normal. You have to talk slow. You, you can use metaphors or pictures. This is very helpful because this communicates much more than the pure words. This is why we used a lot of them in our book. The book is, uh, this is uh, what Chiara mentioned. This is the book which will come out in, at Wireless in July. So in a few weeks you can get it. And then you can read all about it. The problem with the balance between the partners, you said there's no neutrality, Chiara, and this is right, because you will, because we combine individual and couple sessions, I'll show in the next slide, you will be compassionate to one partner when you talk with them in an individual session, and you will ally with the other partner when you have an individual session with him or her. So we try to balance our partici participation. We can reach neutrality, but we can have a balanced um, uh, sympathy for each of them. And the most important issue is that you have to be transparent. You have to, uh, you have to reflect yourself and you have to be able to communicate yourself. So self-disclosure is essential if you work with couples because they will recognize your internal moves, your emotional uh, participation and so on. But, and please don't try to hide it or stay neutral or professional. It works much better if you admit your mistakes, if you say, okay, I'm a bit um, biased by what your partner told me last session and the core of the message was this or that. And um, how do you, f can you stand this? How, can, how do you feel about this? And then you start communicating about these emotional procedures. And this is the model that you give to the couple. So when you try to work in a sterile, uh, technical way, there will be no emotional resonance and no reconnection between you and the couple and the couple with each other. And you, you, have, you have to like this style. Not everybody is prone to work this way. And you need a certain inclination to li liking this kind of working. Because you are part of the resonance room that you're in. And you will see in the, in the videos you get ideas. Kiara presents videos too. So you get, I don't know, Bruce, you have a video as well? No. So we'll have two models, Kiara and me, which is a slightly different. And so you have two options to see how we actually interfere with the couple. And it's much more entangled as we are used to do it in individual sessions. <clears throat> and this is what I mentioned. We offer single sessions as well. This is important because the bold statement of Chiara that we work with every client coming into the room. This is a bold statement. And it only works if you separate the couple and work with each of them, if necessary, in individual sessions. So you can catch up with the pathology of the individual and then link it with the partner. Maybe you have uh, one to th uh, three individual sessions and one conjoint sessions to reconnect the couple, but you 
you can majorly work with one client. But the, the gain is tremendous if you have the partner intermediately in the sessions because you can get support from them, you can explain the model. There are a lot of options you get when you have the partner in the room. It's much more effective than working with an individual alone. So even if you do a primary individual therapy, including the partner on a regular, more or less regular basis is extremely helpful. So I, I tend to work always to include the partners in my individual therapies because it gets, you have much higher momentum. So some basics of the model, you already know them, I keep them short. The, the essence of the schema therapy model is that maladaptive schemas early, have an early onset in life and result from frustrated core needs. To avoid the activation of these schemas, we develop coping modes. The coping modes are the base, or we choose our partners based on chemistry, and chemistry means we are attracted by certain coping modes. Usually we take what we know. Many of them, many of us have married our mothers or fathers. Usually you don't recognize this immediately. It takes you some years, but at the end you'll find that there are traits quite similar between your partners and one of your parents. And th this is what Jeff calls chemistry. And this is majorly how they display the coping modes. And the coping modes lead to what we call a mode cycle and they interfere with each other and ma make this interlocking that seems to be so, so rigid and hard to overcome. And this is why we address it as the core enemy and the core uh, goal of therapy is to address the coping modes and get from the coping modes to the child modes and its need behind the wall of coping modes. This is the essence of the model. <clears throat> The point is, if one partner tries to change, the cycle gets um, destabilized. So usually the partner starts increasing his coping attempts to lock the partner into the cycle. And this leads to escalation, and this is when the couples drop into couples therapy, because they're in an escalating cycle. And if one partner definitely steps out, as you showed in the, in the cartoon before, the, the, the relationship breaks up. Our goal is to, to attract the partner who is in fear of losing the control on the relationship, <clears throat> to include him in therapy and show him ways how he can um, maintain his influence without being rigid and overcompensating. Now we come to the core model, as you pointed it out, Chiara, which is a, a bit neurology-based or neurobiologic biology based. We reduce the child modes. If you know the Dutch mode model, they have a lot of child modes, a listing of six or up to seven child modes. And we, this model that I present to you is more dimensional and dynamic. So we look at the dynamics between the mode groups and it's built up in a dimensional framework. This is the core difference. And the dimensions are a vulnerable or anxious child and an angry and impulsive child. You can check it in yourself. You always shift your emotional activation uh, depending on the situation. You tend more to be anxious, careful, or you tend to be uh, more um, self-assertive and um, active, striving for control. And the background is that we have an attachment system and an assertiveness system in our neurobiology. There are three more systems. Jack Panksepp described five systems, five major systems within us that are the biological basis of our mental setup. And the two most important are the attachment and the assertiveness system. And this is really basic because if you look at the Freudian model, you have the libido and the aggression uh, drive, which are, this would be the libido branch and this would be the aggressive branch. Or you have the tendency to to um, control things and to go for attachment. This is an, or for attachment and autonomy. These are dichotomies that you are quite accustomed to. They are basic in our models, in many and or ex finally all models. So this is why we refer to it. But the important aspect is that we regard them as biologically entrenched, bodily entrenched. And what we feel, the emotions just arise when these systems are challenge. As long as our need for attachment 
are fulfilled, we don't get nervous or anxious or vulnerable. We feel just safe. So we are a happy child. And as long as your assertiveness, um, uh, uh, your, your striving for assertiveness is fulfilled, you won't get angry or uh, overreactive because you're just a happy child uh, willing to do something or to explore the world. And the negative emotions are just a signal that core needs are not met. This is the idea behind it. On the other hand, you have internalized beliefs or appraisals, what we call parent modes, but it's not only driving from the parents as well, from siblings or the peer group. They all contribute to our mindset. And this is completely different because this is biologically entrenched. You are born with these systems. You are born with your basic emotions. But your beliefs are learned. This is part of our so socialization that we learn a belief system, how to behave and what is right and what is wrong. And this is, in our brain, this is stored in different areas than our limbic system emotional procedures. If you look at the publications of Damasio or Ledoux, they focus on the emotional part of our brain. And on the other hand, we have what we learn in, in cognitive therapy. We have mindsets with belief systems which are just... Uh, are the result of our socialization processes. And these are somehow opponents. These beliefs can be addressed or directed to ourself or to others. You can be angry with yourself if you fail to achieve something, or you can be angry at your children if they fail to achieve something. This is the same mindset, but it's once applied to yourself and once to others. It, these, are, these are flexible systems. They can be directed towards yourself or to the outside. If you feel <clears throat> anxious, you tend to be self-directed, careful, watching, passive, or clinging onto something but not externalizing, not controlling, not aggressive. And so you have the same polarity here with a direction to self or others. The, the, the mindset which is self-directed results in mirror neurons which are we call the introject, so the voice of the parent in your head. And you, if you want to address it, <coughs> you, tell the, the, you, you ask your patient, what does the voice in your head say? And this is the voice of your belief system. It appears as a voice. It's, it's normally language. Um, it's entrenched in language. This is close to the body, and this is a voice in the head talking to you, commenting on you. And as, long, as soon as you direct your beliefs to others, you act in a, in a way you, are, you model your parents or your peers like this one, this little one. This is a nice example of modeling. It, it's uh, it's non-conscious. It's just copying behavior. <clears throat> so this is, these are the two essential systems in the background. We call it backstage. This is the emotional activation and the belief activation. And in our model, this is an, an, an and core difference to the, the Dutch model, which is just descriptive, Descript, des, descriptive, right? Because we have two layers. We have the backstage level with the emotional activation in the background and the belief activations in the background. And the combination of the both of them result in coping modes. And the coping modes can be listed in a continuum between an externalizing or alloplastic behavior this is Piaget's polarity of alloplastic and autoplastic behavior, changing the others, changing yourself, by externalizing or internalizing. And you have the, the surrendering coping mode, you have the detached protector, you have the detached self-soother, and the overcompensator or fighting mode. And they are in a continuum, and you can place every existing coping mode somewhere on this continuum. This is a dimensional model again. <coughs> so. Um, this is the part where the animal model with fight, flight, freeze, and surrender belongs to. It's not the schema coping that you should use it for, because the schema is a, something in yourself, and the coping is how you deal with your own schemas. Applying the animal model on an internal process doesn't make much sense. But here it makes a lot of sense, because the animal model describes interaction between two people or animals me and the other, and I can surrender, I can try to fight and gain control, or I can, I, I can try to avoid. This is where this animal model makes sense. But please don't mix freezing and surrendering. 
in a literature, you very often find fight, flight, and freeze as the three ways how to interact with somebody. But there's a surrender missing. Freezing is not surrendering. A, a rabbit that freezes tries not to get in touch with a fox or another animal. It's avoidant. Freezing means avoiding contact. Surrendering maintains contact because an animal that surrenders shows the throat. It surrenders, but it gains attachment. It can remain in the group. And this is very important for survival. Most of the mammals are living in groups, we too. And when we left the jungle to survive in the savanna, we have to build groups. And surrendering is part of the social process of building groups because it establishes a hierarchy. So if I surrender, I'm not withdrawing, I'm surrendering, but remain part of the group. And this is essentially different from freezing. If you freeze, you don't get in touch with somebody else. So it's more precise to talk about surrender, freezing, flighting, and fighting as the four major ways to interact with somebody else. These are just some details to the model. And you see that these arrows that might appear confusing, but the idea is they result in moving internal activations. The emotions shift from the fear to the anger pole, attachment, assertiveness pole, and the beliefs change from externalizing to internalizing. So the idea is if you're anxious and your appraisal tells you be careful and don't, uh, uh, and it's better if you give in, then you will end up in a surrendering coping. But if your emotions turn to anger and your beliefs are outside directed and you think, okay, I have to punish this guy. The way he drives his car is awful. I have to show him how he has to drive his car. Then the beliefs are outside directed. You are angry and this will result in an overcompensation. You will sound your horn or you will um, uh, approach him too much or something. show him that you're the boss on the street. Interesting is if they turn the way that you get angry, but your beliefs are still internally directed. This is very often the case with borderline patients. They are angry, but they, their beliefs tell them, don't act it out, be careful, you're bullshit, you have to be uh, careful, you're not worth anything. And this leads to an increase of tension, inter intrapersonal, and then they hurt themselves, mutilate themselves, or destroy something of their own possessions. Because they are angry, but there's no way out. The anger is blocked because the voice in the head is still inside directed. And then the tension grows and they need an internal escape, either dissociation, self-mutilization, intake of drugs, or any self-soothing behavior. If the belief system turns outside, they will act it out. They will offend the therapist or destroy some belongings of others. But when it's internally directed, it's blocked, and then the tension remains high. You can't act it out, and you get no gain by uh, going into attachment because you're too angry. When you're angry, you don't want attachment. So maybe you can get a certain idea of the mobility of these two systems and the resulting coping. In our view, the coping is just the result of the interplay of the emotional activation and the mindset that you're actually in. And this results logically, physiologically, in the coping modes. So the coping modes are just the dropout of the emotional and the belief system activation. They're just a resulting thing. And this is why we just bypass it. We, fo we don't focus on the coping. The coping is something which is just arbitrary and always changing. Interesting is the emotional activation in the background because it has to be soothed, and the belief system, it has to be reappraised and questioned by the healthy adult, by the therapist. So this is the way to the solution. We need the healthy adult as a self-regulation instance. Overcoming the automatic processing leading to the coping modes, this is the autopilot. The coping modes derive automatically. We don't have to do anything to fall into a coping mode. But we have to do a lot to get out of it. So this is why we need the healthy adult to over, over steer or overrule your automatic processes. This is why you need mindfulness for. You have to be mindful towards your own activation as a therapist too. This is part of the self-reflection. And the patients have to be trained in mindfulness to overcome the automatic processing, falling into the coping modes. The two major screws we can turn on is the reappraisal of the 
beliefs because they are sometimes not explicit. We have to get them into the awareness, what we really think about the partner, and then we can reappraise it. And this leads to readjusted worths and goals, selves and outside directed, the same way. And on the other hand, we have to satisfy our core needs or the partner's core needs, and the vulnerable child becomes a sensitive child again, which is the normal, healthy child. And we try to socialize. And on the other hand, we have to be able to use our power, our gas in the tank. We regard anger as a constructive resource like gas in the tank. You can go somewhere if you have the anger power. Only if the anger is blocked or is not permitted to act out in a fertile and constructive way, it gets uh, malignant. So anger is nothing bad. This is why I like the term of Leslie Greenberg, constructive anger. Anger is power. And as, as long as we can apply the power to a creative social situation, it is helpful and it's just what we need to, to get into action. So you have the same balance again. If you are too sensitive, you might be too withdrawn, too, too cautious. And on the other hand, if, you, if it's balanced with power, you have the ideal ingredients of a good social outcome. You have to be sensitive and you have to be able to get active. So this is what the satisfaction of the core needs should lead to, and this is the happy child. And if you are in this balanced mode, a mood, <laughs> balanced mood, and have adjusted goals, this is where the act part comes in, acceptance and commitment therapy, when it, it deals with adjusting goals. This is an important uh, part of the act approach to, to uh, clarify goals and um, uh, to set directions for therapy. So this is included in our approach as well in schema therapy. So in the same way as you have these four boxes down here, you have one big box with four compartments which stand for this tendency. So this is an important part to validate the coping modes of the patients. They have not done a wrong thing, but they have to, done too much of a good thing. If you fight, you just do too much um, um, you're, you're too active, you're overactive, and if you uh, turn it down a little bit, you can end up in the way that you can. You need a certain fighting capacity to follow your goals and for adequate demanding. You need anger, power to be firm and sturdy and assertive. But it's a controlled anger, it's a moderated anger. And you have to be uh, sensitive and a little bit anxious to become a good team player. When you know that you're vulnerable, you're more inclined to collaborate with others. If you think you're the only person that matters, you won't do that. So a certain uh, stra uh, a little bit vulnerability is good for social processes, to remain cautious and decent. And of course, you need a certain capacity to distance from situations, let others play their games and say, it's not my game. If you want to do it, that's fine. If you, Kiara, want to present in your way, that's fine with me. I do it different. No matter. We can cooperate. And we don't have to fight each other. But this, ne this means that we both need the capacity to be distanced and let others do their things. This, but not in a detached way. We still stay compassionate, but we are distanced. And you have to be able to soothe yourself, but not in an addictive way. So th this is another dimensional construct between disintegration and dysfunctional behavior because it's too much of a good thing, and integration and functional behavior, which means you, you, that you're able to flexibly react and change your strategy. And you don't get trapped because you are trapped in your fighting mode, and you can't get out of it. It's important if you have a couple, they have to fight. There is no development without fight. If you look at David, David Snark's position, he says this is the motor of development. A couple which gets stuck in harmony, there will be no development. So a couple that fights a little bit is a healthy couple. But if you got trapped in an overcompensating mode, then it's no longer fertile and creative. You have to be flexible and you have to give in and say, okay, this was too much, sorry, I was too harsh, no. Let's, let me put it again. You, you have to remain flexible as a therapist and as the partner as well. So this is the model. It looks a bit complicated on the first glance, but if you 
this is all. This is the whole model. This is the whole mode map. Everybody, you can locate every move you make on this map. How you feel now, how your partner feels. So this is the good part of the story, nothing else but this map. And you can place every mode, every coping mode, somewhere here in the continuum, every emotional activation, and all the beliefs are either self or other directed. It simplifies the mode landscape a little bit. And you have an overseeable number of modes, and the, 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 the patients easily grasp these number of modes, and then they learn to, to place themselves where they are on the mode map now. And you can ask them. If you look at the map, and the maps are actually the chairs, this is what Chiara will point out later, the chairs are ordered in the way as the modes are on the map. And then you can ask the patient, where are you now on the coping continuum? And on what part of the child mode you're in? Maybe it's both. Maybe it's anger and fear. You have simultaneous activations as well. It's no problem. Then you're somewhere in between or oscillating between anger and fear. If you look at yourself, you will recognize that you always shift between these two poles. And this is bodily entrenched. Either you're anxious or you're aggressive. So it's like a continuous movement in your, in your body and in your mind. So this is a limited picture. Okay, what are the relevant mode cycles? You have an overcompensation submission uh, cycle which is stable, which is more a collusion. But usually it's not very friendly and open for development. It's rigid and couples who find themselves in such a cycle won't come to therapy as long as the submissive partner remains submissive. The problem starts when a therapist interferes and says, why are you so submissive? Maybe you better stand up against your partner or withdraw from an overcompensating partner. And then you have the typical mode cycle, which, according to Gottman's data, within five or four to five years to 80% gets separated because it tends to be more and more instable because if the primarily submissive partner starts to avoid, the overcompensator will increase his in terms of control. This is what I mentioned before, and this starts the escalation. So this is the typical cycle the couple is in when it comes into our office. Um, if you have two overcompensators, this is very fragile. You can look at the video of who is afraid of Virginia Woolf. They start fighting for a moment. After a few mi minutes, they, one has to drop out and goes into avoidance or surrendering. So you have these short uh, uh, passages of overcompensation cycles, but they are not persistent. What persistence is, is an avoidance-avoidance cycle, which is stagnation. And this is where very many couples find themselves after some years in a more or less fertile form. But this is, if you have a couple which is in this state, this is hard to make, apply therapy on them because they are not active, they remain passive, and they might mourn but will not be able to get active. And this is, you have to address this. There are two detached protectors if you put it in more terms. Yeah. Um, what we're trying to head for is a healthy adult cycle, of course. We try to reinforce the healthy adult modes in both partners, and this is what helps to grow. I, re I repeat what Chiara always mention, already mentioned, the mode cycle is the enemy. So there is a little bit of systemic perspective in our model that we address that we have a third party. And this is helpful. The couple always addresses the problem to each other, mutually. If you change, everything would be right. If you stop yelling, if you stop betraying, if you stop whatever, it will be right. So this is a, a dyadic perspective. And as soon as you introduce the mode cycle as a third party, you have a triangle, you have a triadic position. And this helps the couple to reconnect as a working alliance against the mode cycle. And if you manage to, um, uh, that the couple steps into this model, that they both work to stop the mode cycles, then you have an alliance between the couple again. And this is helpful. This creates a different atmosphere. It reestablishes a working atmosphere that you have a common goal, and this is the stopping the mode cycles, getting away from the mode cycles. And this makes a better atmosphere. So this is an important part. If you look at an example of an um, overcompensating withdrawing mode cycle, this is the normal model that you have to deal with. You have, for example, on the backstage, you have an 
angry child mode, which probably the partner is not actually aware of. He will fall into a coping mode, an over-controller, for example, which is overt and which is conscious. And this will have an impact on the emotional situation of the other partner and maybe make him anxious, activates the vulnerable child, which leads to a detached coping. <clears throat> and the detachment makes partner one even more angry. He increases his control attempts. And this is how the cycle starts uh, circulating. <clears throat> it gets faster and faster. One partner gets crazy, the other disappears. So this is how the mode cycle um, starts and maintains himself. This is the mode cycle clash card. It looks a bit overwhelming in the first glance as well, but it's all you need for couples therapy. This is your whole case conceptualization. If you look at it that way, it's not too much. It's compiled by the two mode maps, and you don't have to fill out all of these fields. If you're a bit OCD-like, you might tend to do that, but you don't have to. The, the entrance point, you can start with the coping modes. You have the two coping modes, this has the two partners, you have the two coping modes, and you, you can jump in. If you have a couple struggling like the one in the video, and I'll tell you, you, just will, you will train that in a few minutes to interrupt this couple <clears throat> by using this card. Um, you can just kick in labeling the coping modes. And after you label the coping modes, you ask what is the emotion, the basic emotion behind your coping mode? This is here. And how do you affect the emotional backstage level of your partner? And then you get these four fields. And this is the core of the mode cycle clash cards. It's easy to enter with the coping modes. You see the coping modes. It's no problem. And not only you can uh, uh, label it, the patients learn very quickly. If you just offer them the, the three options, you can reduce it to three. Fight, avoidance, and surrender. And you ask him, what is your behavior now in session belonging to? Is it fighting, is it avoiding, or is it surrendering? If I asked the woman, she would say, oh, I, don't, I, I just have to do this. I don't want to know why you do this. I don't want to look at the content. I just want to know, are you fighting, avoiding, or surrendering? There's nothing else. This reduces the complexity. If you have just three options, you can make multiple choice. Yeah. And she has to take one of them. There's nothing else. It's a dimensional model. Yeah. Either fighting, avoiding, or surrendering. You can be bef between fighting and surrendering. Okay, then you have to decide. But finally, you channel the complexity of the interaction to, to be able to fight. You once need the energy, the power. If you're too weak, you can't fight, even if you would like to. And you need the permission to do it. Your belief system has to tell you, you are entitled to show them the way. So if both comes together, you will end up fighting. If you're blocked, you have to find another hole for the rabbit, <laughs> as uh, Bruce said. And this hole could be self-cutting, drinking alcohol, which is not offending others. This is permitted by your belief system. Mutilating yourself is OK, but not others. So this is the, the door, the, the exit, the emergency exit that is still able to be accessible to them. This is how they get out. They are too angry to submit and too blocked to fight. So all is left is something in between. Dissociation, drinking, self mutilization something like that. This is the idea. You can, you can feel it. Yeah? You, you are angry, but you say, OK, if, I, if, if you tell this to your wife, she will be divorced. So you're angry, but your belief system blocks you off, and then you run out of the door and go into the bar and drink three whiskey. This would be a self-soother. Because the rest of your belief system tells you, don't cross this red line. If your belief system turns even more outside directed, and this, this bitch just deserves to be left by me, there's no problem if she runs out or if she divorces. That's the best that could happen to me then you'll yell at her or beat her or do whatever, overcompensating 
you'd like to. But they need permission, internal permission. As long as your, your belief system blocks you off, you won't fight, which could be actually healthy. This is what we finally implement with a healthy adult, a voice that says, don't do that. You will regret it. Stay calm. Don't act it out. It's just a momentary lapse of reason. Yeah. Get off, get into another room, let it calm down. So this is healthy detachment. Yeah. And maybe then later you come in and say, okay, I understand your reasons, but I don't want you to talk to me this way. This is fighting, but this is healthy fighting. And that's the kick. Not dropping down into the old coping modes, but act it out in a, play it out in, in a modest and, and disciplined way. This is what the healthy adult does. He just modulates, he just regulates. You can't invent a new solution. There is nothing else but avoiding, surrendering, and fighting. But you can do it in a rough, aggressive style, or you can do it in a more elegant style. And this is what we try to teach the people. What you're doing is not wrong, but you, you, you can do it better. No? We are better together. This is Chiara's motto. Okay, you get the idea? Fine, thank you. Thank you for asking. So, there's still some time left. If you want to work with couples, you have to be able to cope with these technical problems. <laughs> You're, they, they'll set you under stress anyway. <laughs> so, you need a certain capacity to calm yourself down. And So, this is not the worst thing that could happen in a laboratory with couples. The energy drops out. So this is fine. So let me come back to the model. For this first step, we'll come back to it later after the break, but what we have to face is only this part. Labeling the coping modes, making a choice out of three, what kind of mode is it? Come back to the child modes, and the child modes are just four. If you look at Paul Ackman, he has six basic emotions. There's surprise, this is not interesting for us because it's not emotionally loaded. Happiness, this is where we try to get to. So there are four left. Anger, disgust, sadness, and fear. And this is helpful. You do the same when you try to come to the child mode level. You ask the patient, do you feel more angry, more disgusted, more sad, or more fearful? It must be one of these four. As the core feeling, the basic emotion behind your social emotions. In the coping mode, you have social emotions. Ha hatred, entitlement, shame, uh, hopelessness. This is all influenced by beliefs. To feel hopeless, you need the voice in your head telling there's no way out. To feel entitled, you need the voice in your head saying he just deserves it. Yeah? To feel ashamed, you need a voice saying you're the most disgusting thing, thing in the world. <laughs> There is no social emotion without appraisal because we learn social emotions. This is why we call them social emotions because they derive from social interactions. Basic emotions are inborn, are natural, are pure. And this is helpful if you ask a patient, were you born with your shame or your hatred or your greediness? Definitely not. A child is not greedy, it's needy. Jeff's wording. So you, you lead the social emotions back to the core, to the nucleus of basic emotions within them. If you have hatred, there's anger. If you have hopelessness, it's sadness. If you're very, um, um, if you're panicky, it's anger, uh, sorry, it's anxiety, fear. And this is the same, you do the same way, you offer them four options, four basic emotions, and so you get a reduced complexity that you can cope with these small fields here. You can write in it's more anger or more sadness. And this is how it works. It's, it's uh, channeling the complexity of the interaction into very, very rough but overseeable pieces. The first thing is we have to stop these clashing coping modes. This is the first aid for the couple. Stop shooting. That's not peace, this is just stop shooting, but it's the first step to get into a, a, a peace contract. And there's no reason what it is for. What we do is we take the mode cycle clash card, it's another example for a third party. You have the couple and they both look on the clash card. And what I want you to experience is how the energy immediately drops down 
when you interrupt the clashing couple, hold them the paper on before their faces, they have to turn the faces away from mutually looking at each other onto the paper, and then you ask them, okay, Betty, this is you, what coping mode are you in right now? Right now, not last week, not one year ago, right now, in session, because we see everything in session. We have the full control over the process. So we just ask you, what are you doing right now? Focus on the in session behavior, describe and label the coping of both, write it into the MCC, and this leads the tension away from the couple to the clash card. This is what I mentioned, no content, no reasons, nothing. It doesn't interest who's guilty. It doesn't interest who started it. A cycle is always, you can interrupt a cycle, cycle wherever you want to, but it's a cycle. So don't ask for guilt for reasons and so on. If this couple starts clashing again, immediately stop now and say, what mode are you going into right now? Starting fighting again, starting withdrawing again. So you, this is the leash where you lead them. And if you ask questions like, what mode are you in now? You interrupt their automatic processing. You force them to reflect. And this is helpful because they get in a more healthy adult mode when reflecting, when trying to, to monitor what they actually did. This is a very helpful technique to introduce self-reflection and interrupt automatic processing. And then you start separating the coping from the child mode. This is all that you have to do now. This is not too much, right? You feel able to do that. You're great. I want to give you a brief overview about the major steps that we have to take in a more metaphoric way when we work with the couple. The first is basically we explain at least parts of the model. I taught some of you in the small groups. You can do the teaching in the process. If you, when you just give the little pieces of education on the spot when it's needed to identify the coping, to identify the core needs, you just give a little bit of explanation or education. But if you have a cooler couple, you can do it before you start the work in, working with the mode cycle clash cards. This means to explain to them how does sewing work. Sewing, you know, homeworkers do that a lot of time. And this is the metaphor. Um, it helps if you have a certain idea how it works. And the next step is if you saw the wrong way, you have to stop it. If there's no, it doesn't work if you try to push it back and you will break the, the, the saw and it won't work. So even if it feels bad, when you're running into a dead end street, you have to go back. If you like it or not, no way. Go back first. This means stopping the cycle. The next step is if you readjust yourself in a more self-reflective state, when healthy adult is on board again, then you can restart. But first you have to understand what went wrong, turn the saw in the right direction, and start sawing again very carefully or mindfully. This is what we do as the homework is you have your thumb and then you very, very carefully start sawing again. You know that. Everybody who's doing uh, these, these uh, you don't call it homework, how, how do you call this? When you build chairs or, do yeah, the do-it-yourself stuff, you know, where these shops are for, where you get all these materials. You know, right? And then you saw very carefully. And this means they need communication skills. This is what we will show you maybe in, in, in later parts of the workshop. And a very interesting part of couples therapy with the schema model is using imagery to reconnect the couple. The difference to a CBT approach is we don't just teach them techniques. What we already did up to this point, stopping the mode cycles, is still technique. But what it, when it becomes interesting is when we use imagery to emotionally reconnect or help them to reconnect emotionally. And finally, after the reconnection and using adequate communication skills, then they have to maintain their partnership and keep the saw clean and practice. And this is your fix means that they talk on a regular basis, maybe twice a week for 30 minutes, in the way we teach them the communication skills. And they have positive activities alone or together just to have good moments in their relation. So these five steps are the major um, roadmap that, you, that we follow.
This is just an outline. You get all the details in the book, but just to show you how the whole process is designed. And the idea is that we have the mode cycle. You already know that. But now it's arbitrary if we start here or here. Every, both partners are requested to change into a healthy adult coping and not in a maladaptive coping. So once you step out the cycle and don't fall into your old automatic coping, but main, manage to shift into the healthy adult mode, then the point is that first you have to soothe yourself, cool your personal in-person emotion down, and this interrupts the cycle. So if both partners do that, no cycle appears. And once you did that, you can do what Chiara mentioned in her very first introducing statements. You can try to heal your partner in, this, in the next step by cooling his emotional activation down too. And this is where uh, the relationship becomes really healthy and fertile when we start helping each other instead of fighting each other. And when one of the partners manages to get into a healthy adult and remains in the healthy adult, even if the other one is attacking, he can become a helpful resource for the partner. This is where partnership becomes fun. So how does imagery work? You do, basically you start in the same way as you do it with the individual, but you do it in the presence of the partner. All close their eyes. That's important because the, the working partner doesn't want to be observed by the partner. You can only do that once they stop clashing. First, is the, first step is stop clashing, starting to separate, to cre create a safe space between the, the couple and yourself. In the center of the room, there's a safe space where you can create something new. This is And the imagery work starts, it's, it's helpful to start with a more withdrawn partner to bring him into therapy. But it is, it's a good idea to, to mutually do it. So once you do it with one partner in the next or over next session, it's good to do it with the other partner so they get the mutual experience of these emotional activations. Um, and then you, uh, as you learn it in the individual therapy, you start with a current clash situation he goes into the emotions, not primary, but basic emotions. Primary is the concept of Les Greenberg. It's a bit different. We talked about basic emotions. That's my fault on the slide. And focus on the body sensation. This is helpful to focus on the basic emotions. They are experienced on the body. Remember Damasio, our core self starts developing with bodily experiences. And emotions are the, the, the overtones of the body reactions. Then they let him float back into childhood, picture it, focus on the emotions in the child scene, and this is how we introduce biography into therapy. I, uh, if you start with a clashing couple, there's no time to take a biography for, for a longer term. They, they won't, they're not patient enough. And you can start under fire with the, in the way we trained in the first exercise, and if you do imagery work, you get very selective biographical scenes which give you much more information than the narrative biography they give you when you ask for them in the session. So this is where I see where we get the real important biography in these childhood scenes in imagery work. And then you name the core needs, and now this, the point is, this is a bit too short. I have to explain it in more detail. We are working on different ways to apply this technique. But for me now, the best way to do it is not to remain in the child mode, but acknowledge the child mode and the core needs of the child, but then ask the partner as the adult, come back into adult mode, and then as the adult, ask the partner for support. I think this is a little bit important because our idea is not primarily reparenting in the situation because this is risky. If the partner doesn't do it very well, you, you will set new hurdings. 
But if you manage that they get in touch with their child modes and then get into adult mode again, and then as the adult connected with the needs and the child experience asks for support as the adult that he or she is now, you are on the eye level again. And this is safer for the working partner. And then he asks for support in the present situation, not the child situation, the present situation. And then the partner can give his best to support the, or the therapist supports if necessary, and then look for a good reconnection, a good outcome in the present situation. And this is helpful because the, the sensible part of moving backwards into the child mode is done under the control of the therapist. And once the partner is reconnected with his core needs and his childhood experience, and then asks the partner for support, you're, he's safer again. He's, he's in the adult mode again. He's not that vulnerable. So this is safer for you and for the working partner. Did you get this detail? Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and then they both give feedback how they perceive the partner, the situation, to, to induce discrimin, uh, discrimination between the old cycle and the new cycle. But we are always there to interfere and correct and put it into positive words. You have to be careful that they don't use uh, devaluating words. 